the aliens. Okay. Well, we live in a random corner in the far edge of the Milky Way galaxy. Fermi's paradox is that, well, look, if life evolved, it would basically colonize the galaxy and you could calculate, it would send out robots or, or parts of its civilization to four other planets that would then send to four and, other planets. And, and if you Everything would go exponentially. It's not a bad logic, but I don't think it's inevitable. We are electric men. We've got electric hands So come stand beside us And realize That the thing we must do Is inspire We're coming for you We are about to get in our hands the tools that may help us prove for once and for all that we're not alone. And, and I'm talking specifically about the James Webb Space Telescope and the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope. My point is that the next generation of telescopes, both optical and radio, will, I think, show us a very crowded cosmos. Uh, I, I wrote a piece saying whatever they are, they're not aliens. good news, I think, is that ours is likely to be the generation that will make that profound, game-changing discovery that it's not just us. Lawrence and Nick are going to have about a 60-minute discussion up here, maybe shorter. And we're going to open it up. We want to make this kind of like a group conversation tonight. We have a mic here for uh, Q&A. And we hope you guys partake in, in it. And um, feel free to get up, even if you don't have the exact idea of your question formed. It's OK to get up and stumble a little bit. That's what Pangburn's all about. If you want to learn more about Pangburn and get involved, we are a global online community that is grounded in the laws of good faith, helpful discourse. Good faith meaning sincerity of intentions, so being sincere, and helpfulness, um, giving each other a helping hand, whether it's through the dialectic or in other ways. So you can uh, join us on our Discord server if you want to engage in our daily conversations. Just search Pangburn Discord, and we talk about things like this every day. And uh, please do join us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash pangburn, and you can view all of the events that we've produced, live discussions. And hello to everyone on YouTube, by the way, because we are live streaming this event. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage Lawrence Krauss and Nick Pope. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for pra braving the weather. <laughs> And also Google Maps, figuring out how to get in this building, <laughs> which I had trouble with. Um, I'm just going to start off a little bit, because I've, I've done some events with Travis before. And um, for the, I'm, a, I'm a theoretical physicist who does not study UFOs um, for, for good reason, uh, I'll try and argue. Um, but there's a lot of interest in the, in the media lately. And I, long ago, before Travis was born, I used to <laughs> debate people who called themselves UFOlogists or something. And I just, they, you know, they, they made their living with that. And, and I quickly learned, obviously, that they made their living with that and the, and the discussions were not particularly worthwhile. Um, so I, I didn't do it again. And then when Travis asked me to do this, and, and he 
said it was with Nick, and I, I learned a little about Nick. I thought, okay, well, this can be a rational discussion. So, so um, uh, I still hope to disabuse him and you of any false ideas you have. But, <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to begin by reading one of my favorite quotes about this. One of the reasons, so what, I think the title is What's Going On Up There, and my apologies to at least the two people I could see from the side, is that whatever's going up, uh, on up there, it's not aliens. I want to make that clear. Okay, now that sounds closed-minded. So I wanted to start with a, just a quote from one of my heroes, Richard Feynman, who talked about this, and some of you may have seen Richard wrote this. But he also makes some useful things about science, which is really important. He said, it's not unscientific to make a guess, although many people who are not in science think, that it, think it is. Some years ago, I had a conversation with a layman about flying saucers, because I'm scientific. I know about flying saucers, as I said. I don't think they're flying saucers. So my antagonist said, is it impossible that they're flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? No, I said, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. And he said, you are very unscientific, which, which I've got accused of when I tweeted about this event. You are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then how can you say it's unlikely? But that's the way it is. That's, that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's likely and what's less likely, and not to be proving all the time what's possible and impossible. We don't do that in science. In fact, we talk, when I talk in a different context to people who believe in supernatural deities, I, I also indicate that belief is not a word that we should use in science. It's either things are likely or not likely. To define what I mean, I might have said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think it's much more likely that reports of flying saucers are the results of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence than of the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. And I think that's the key point. In, 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 as, I will, as we may get to, I will argue that while there's no doubt things, people see things that they can't explain and that maybe other people can't explain, that any explanation you can come up with, regardless of how absurd it is, is more likely, much more likely, than the possibility that we're being visited by extraterrestrials. So that's where I'm coming from, and maybe during our, our dialogue back and forth, I'll explain why I have that argument and why I don't think it's unscientific to, to argue that it's unlikely enough that I don't want to spend my time studying it. But let me turn it over to Nick and, and ask him to talk about his background and where, how he came to this. I think it'll give the right perspective. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Travis, for having us both here. And I think it's very important to, as, as Travis articulated in his introduction, to have a good faith conversation about this subject, because wherever one stands on, on the topic of UFOs, or UAP, as they're now called, yeah, and yeah. we can get into some, some interesting talk about the name change, wh wherever people stand, if, if you go on to social media in particular, and, and I think we've both experienced yeah. this, you'll see, and, and you could say this applies to a whole range of issues, but it certainly applies to this one, this massive polarization where you just get this, this skeptic versus believer split and this absolute chasm where there's no attempt to, to reach out the hand and, and shake the hand and have a dialogue. It's just either on the one side, uh, you're a complete fruitcake believing this, it's all just nut jobbery. And on the other side, you're an evil government debunker for suggesting. And, and that really doesn't help anyone because those sorts of people aren't suddenly going to change their minds. Mm -hmm. But there are, I think, people in the middle mm -hmm. on this issue, on a lot of issues, who would, I hope, benefit from a discussion like this. And now, just very briefly, um, my, my own background, for those that don't know, I am not a scientist. I am a, a former UK government employee. I was a civilian employee of the UK Ministry of Defense, which is the equivalent of, of the DOD here. And I had a 21-year career there, doing a lot of different jobs, and one of those jobs in the early 90s was I had responsibility for the UFO issue. I had to investigate the cases and assess 
whether or not there were any defense, national security, or safety of flight issues posed by this. And we, we essentially concluded that there were, self-evidently because there were things in our airspace that we couldn't explain, and from time to time they did come dangerously close to both commercial and military aircraft, uh, to the point where literally people had to on occasion take evasive action. Now, our position, we tried not to be conclusion-led in any of this. So we didn't go in thinking it's extraterrestrial. Neither did we go in thinking it can't be extraterrestrial. We, we just tried to say, well, what could it be? And, of course, going back through the archive of files, going back decades, because governments have been doing this for, for many, many years, most of the sightings fell into the following, I, I would say, four categories. Misidentifications, uh, deliberate fabrications like hoaxes, psychological delusions, and, and, and this is more recent perhaps, but sensor errors on, on a whole range of military systems. But, but we felt that there was something over and above that, and you know, before I throw it back to Lawrence, I mean, I think one of the reasons we're here is that in the last six years, there has been a fringe to mainstream transition of this subject. One could say, I think, that it started on December 16th, 2017, when the New York Times broke actually two related stories um, and, and put them on the front page. The first was the existence of three US Navy videos of UAP, which are still characterized on the DOD website as being unidentified. And the second related was the existence of a Pentagon unit called ATIP, which stood for Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And, and of course, for years, the US government had said we're no longer interested in UFOs, and nobody's been investigating this since the end of 1969, when the old US Air Force program, Project Blue Book, was closed down. Now, that turned out to be not correct. And what we've seen from then until now is, is more and more revelations and engagement on this. So after years of saying they're not interested uh, and, and they don't study it, NASA is now in the game and act actively looking at this. The Pentagon now has a unit called ARROW, which stands for All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. God, they love this word salad mm -hmm. stuff. Um, uh, Congress is engaged both in the Senate and the House, uh, the Armed Services Committees, the Intelligence Committees, the Oversight Committees, and there are multiple UAP provisions in the current defense bill and currently being debated and negotiated for next year's bill, so the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024. I'm not this evening going to tell you that aliens definitely exist because I have no smoking gun. But what I want to put out there is the, the, the possibility, the two interrelated but separate questions. Is there life out there in the universe? I, I think a lot of, pre pretty much most people are coming around to the view that almost certainly yes. Mm -hmm. Are we being visited? That is a separate question for all sorts of scientific impediments to interstellar travel on a viable basis, which Lawrence knows far more about than I and will expouse in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, but, but I want to say that even if something is not likely and has a low order of possibility, governments and the military and the intelligence community does take this sort of thing seriously. And we sometimes call it in government low probability, high impact scenario. E even if it has a comparatively small chance of being actually true, the societal implications, if any of this does turn out to be true, are such that we should be in the game and studying it. So I am very glad that we're having this discussion. I'm very glad that NASA, that the DOD, 
um, that Congress are having these discussions, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and I hope more scientists and academics will come on board because, again, as Travis, I think, said in his intro, these questions are some of the biggest and profound questions that we can ask ourselves, and why wouldn't we want to try and get an answer? Okay, that's, that's a great sort of intro to... Uh, um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons that this, be, as you pointed out, has become so such a great interest is because of the ridiculous... When the government is doing something and, and, they, and they don't say they're doing it, inevitably it gets discovered, and that gives the illusion that there's something to hide, which is so it's always much better to say... I think they were embarrassed about saying that they were actually considering this, and they figured it would be better to say they weren't. And the concern of embarrassment over, overrode the, the recognition that it, would, that it would inevitably come out, which is one of... Let me say, I have to say, when you were saying that Congress is investigating it, that did make me laugh, of course, because it's probably one of the... Looking for UFOs is probably one of the more realistic things that the Republican Party is doing right now in this country. But um, the, the notion that... one of the, For me, besides the physics problems, and you're involved in the UK government, which tried to be transparent about this, I think, and, and transparently report what was, what was reported to them, um, and, I've, and, I, and I think being transparent is very, very important. But uh, um, one of the things about it, besides the physics aspects, and we can get into why it's so unlikely that, that it's so difficult, if not impossible, to imagine people or beings coming here. Um, but for me, one of the biggest arguments against it is exactly this secrecy notion that somehow... And I've been to Roswell, and I've been, I, and, and uh, I'll tell you that story sometime. But uh, the notion that the government could keep a secret of something of this immense potential significance effectively, to me, is much more, much harder to believe than the physics aspects of get, of, of of getting here, especially when you consider that if anyone actually had real evidence, if any individual who was a party to that amazing conspiracy that some people think exists, it, it, there is so much money to be made in coming forward with that evidence that I find it absolutely impossible to imagine that, 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 that the government could keep a secret, as it obviously can't. It couldn't even keep a secret about the fact of whether they were investigating it. Uh, so I find that sort of sociological fact almost more difficult to believe, mm -hmm. that the conspiracy theory almost di more difficult to believe than the, than, than, the UF, than the alien theory. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, no, that's an interesting point. On, on secrecy, I would say this. Um, obviously, self-evidently, when we talk about this, we can only talk about secrets which have been disclosed, yeah. wh whether legally or, or through, through illegal leaks. Mm -hmm. But I know, as see, governments do successfully keep secrets all the time. And, and I mean, I know, thinking back historically, um, I've personally been involved with, with things way back then that have not leaked. And one could say that um, you know, the, the likelihood of something leaking depends on a number of factors. It depends on the, the number of people uh, obviously working on it, but also the loyalty of those people, the, the um, penalties in terms of the criminal justice system that they would, would face if they leaked something illegally, and, and indeed the penalties in terms of national damage that would result. I mean, take, for example, historically, the people working on, on uh, the Manhattan Project. Um, no one would have wanted to have gone to the, the media and, and tell people about that. And I know that part of that was compartmentalized, but there were, there were plenty of people who, who knew what it was all about. And of course, for, for reasons of patriotism and, and such like, didn't say that. And, and the, the breaking of the German codes during the Second World War is another example of a, a secret that was kept for a long time. And people have this sort of false memory that that secret emerged in 1945 at the end of the war, and, and there was a sort of, ha-ha, we were reading your codes. A absolutely not true. It was um, late 60s, early 70s before that was disclosed. So, I mean, governments can keep secrets, and, and on, specifically on the UAP issue, 
If, if you go now to the Arrow website, which is aaro.mil, and, and see they are now, as a result of provisions in the 2023 defense bill, saying, because they are legally, congressionally mandated yeah. to, to report to Congress on any historical programs that do relate to technologies that might be extraterrestrial, they, they are saying, um, if you have information about these programs, please you know, contact us in confidence. But it's, it's a little bit of a mess, because at the moment, Arrow is investigating some of these claims. Congress is, both in the Senate and the House, and as I mentioned, in a range of those committees. And, and so is the Intelligence Community Inspector General, because there have been some whistleblower complaints. So it's a little bit of a mess, but literally this week, there have been negotiations in Congress on this issue. Yeah, the, 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 um, the it, it is interesting that, that I think that whether, how effectively secrets are kept are probably inversely proportional to the, to the um, payoff that someone who reports on them can get. National offense issues, strictly national offense issues, are the areas which are mostly kept secret. And, 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 um, but of course, the, the Manhattan Project was not only, you gotta remember, Roswell was 1947. So we all, we, we all saw Matt Oppenheimer. We all, <laughs> and, and, but well before that, in fact, well before the Manhattan Project was completed, the Russians already knew about it, okay? Because, because there were spies, and actually a British spy, as you probably know. Wait but, a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, um, <laughs> and, and uh, um, uh, what was your other example? That was the... Uh, the Enigma codes. Yeah, the, the, the Enigma codes, the... once again. The Enigma codes were around the same time as, as the first reportings of UFOs, but we also know about, it's not a secret anymore. And both of these things have a much smaller payoff, much less incentive a whistleblower could go to jail for reporting on a national defense issue. But a, but a whistleblower who said, here is an arm or a tentacle from an alien, and here it is, it's non-biological. Here is a piece of structure that actually, you know absolutely that there's zero chance that they would go to jail. So, but there's a huge chance that they would then get a $5 million book contract. And, and, and those are the kind of things that make me suspicious but more than that is the fact that, you're right, there are all these mandates to report on investigations. And what's great is that the reports have come out that, in fact, after all this time and all these investigations, there is zero evidence. The NASA committee, which is actually run by an old colleague and, and a friend of mine, David Spurgle, who's now the president of the Simons Foundation here in New York City, um, and, and, you know, I don't instance who's a graduate student, um, d came out and, and definitively said, after all of this, that. We've done this investigation, and sure, there are things we, we can't identify. There are things we don't, and we don't know what they are, but there is zero evidence that anything is extraterrestrial. So, yes, it's great that these places are investigating it, although one doesn't want to waste too much time and money on it when there's other things that could be done. But, but the fact, that, the fact that, that there are investigations going on is not the same as saying there's any credible evidence. And, and so I think the idea of a smoking gun from the fact that things are being investigated, especially in the current time, is, is in the public has gotten this, this, given the public this sense that there's something there to be investigated. And clearly there is in the sense that scientists and more particularly defense people would like to be able to better analyze any data that comes in to try and infer what the, what the identity is of things that we can't quite identify right now. And one of the, one of the recommendations of that NASA committee was, was a whole bunch of things that can be done using AI and other things to better analyze uh, data. Uh, and, and, but the, 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 the notion, one of the reasons I don't think many scientists, other than engineers, many detailed scientists uh, get involved in this it relates to what you said in a, in a way, and I had this discussion with someone just yesterday. The notion of considering the possibility of extraterrestrial life in the universe is fascinating. I spend time thinking about it, a lot of people do, because that would be a remarkable 
discovery of incredible importance, not just about the universe, but of great significance for, for humanity. Discovering what the cause of someone inferring that something that looks like a race graph might be a balloon or that you, the speed that's inferred from a certain piece of data is not right, those are interesting questions. They're engineering questions. But what you learn from that, it's not going to be fundamental at all. And I think that's why you don't see many scientists getting interested in it because the payoff of trying to figure out why these unidentified objects are, are unidentified is of interest for defense purposes and of interest for engineering purposes, but it's not a fundamental science question. The question that you did refer to, which is the existence of life elsewhere in the universe, which is a, is a very interesting question and one in which I think we can talk about and mm -hmm. which I, I think there are huge developments going on and um, a much greater likelihood of being able to, to, I think in my lifetime, in fact, maybe within the next decade, we'll have clear evidence that life exists, life exists elsewhere, even potentially in the solar system. I would be very, I would be surprised if we didn't get evidence, not, not Mars is more ambiguous, because Mars is not a decoupled system, but from the oceans in, under Europa or Enceladus, um, but, but we're also with the James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes able to look at planets and image them and image their atmospheres and potentially so life, I suspect, is ubiquitous. Intelligent life is a much bigger problem and, and a much harder, much harder to imagine that there's a particularly intelligent life near enough to detect it, even though it's worth at least private money looking for, and there's a lot of private money looking for it. Do you want to? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point, and, and I totally agree that it, it is very likely, I think, sooner rather than later, that we will find scientific proof of life elsewhere in the universe. Maybe, yeah, maybe in the solar system. Uh, I'm obviously more excited by the, the chances that we might find intelligent life or, or evidence of intelligent life, and that might come about, for example, through, through the SETI program, yeah. through, through detecting a, a, a signal or a message, uh, of, obviously, of artificial origin, or it might come around through, through the detection of a, a techno signature. Um, say, you know, scientists have speculated about the theoretical possibility of, of things like Dyson spheres that might be detectable. And that would, and I, I was thinking about this actually earlier today. I thought, is there a way, is there a way to kind of encapsulate very simply the arguments about life in the universe. And I thought, and this may be a little simplistic, but I'll, I'll try it out. And I thought, the, the way to come at this is to say, either it is impossible for intelligent life to exist in the universe, or it's possible. And we are the proof mm -hmm. that it is possible. So all, all, in a sense, all we can say is it is possible that intelligent life can emerge. We know that it can because it has. And, and so I'm very excited by what that means. And I think, again, I was thinking about this discussion and I thought, you know, the whole ethos of, of these events is maybe to try and find some common ground. And where mm. I think we might find some common ground is, is the intellectual stimulation of thinking about what I call the, the next order of questions. In other words, if we do discover, <laughs> if, if we do discover um, extraterrestrial life, sorry, we're hearing some strange things. You want to close in, that door? Maybe that might help. In our um, headsets. You, you were here. planning a chorus, <laughs> were you, Travis? <laughs> no. no. Oh, okay. um, I think the thing that excites me is the societal implications of discovering extraterrestrial yeah. life. And yeah, intelligent life, obviously, at, at the high end of the spectrum, but even microbial life would profoundly affect, I think, our worldview. And, and we could have, and perhaps should have, a discussion about the ramifications of this, because I think particularly intelligent life would, would have implications for politics, religion, science, oh. technology, uh, yeah. philosophy, and yeah. well, everything. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, obviously, if the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe would be 
unbelievably important scientifically. I used to believe many years ago that it would have a big effect on religion. I don't think so anymore. Religion really is independent of evidence. And so um, I think that there, that I used to think if you came across another civilization that either didn't have a deity or different kinds of deities, it would impact it. But religion can always t mold itself to use any bit of evidence as kind of support. So I don't think, but it would have a tremendous impact. But it's not, it's far less likely than discovering the existence of life. And you know, I've written about both subjects a lot. But let me just say a few things before maybe I get into the physics of why it's so unlikely to imagine we're being visited. But even if, um, you know, I wrote a book called The Physics of Star Trek a long time ago, and, and, uh, uh, and I pointed out, um, you know, I, was, I had friends who were involved in SETI, and I was involved in a little, little bit of that, and that even, so the galaxy is pretty big. There are 100 billion stars. We now know there are probably 100 billion solar systems. Almost every star has a solar system. So that increases the possibility of life of one sort or another. Um, th th there's two things, like two scientific things I want to say. Uh, um, one is that even if intelligent life exists, and it's probably extremely rare, but because you have to think of all the factors, the Earth is, it took four billion years almost for the, uh, well, um, about four billion years for intelligent life. By intelligent life, I mean technologically intelligent. I mean, dolphins may be intelligent, but they're not emitting signals that can be detected outside uh, our solar system. And it took almost four billion years in a, in a very special environment. So it's probably rare, but rare doesn't matter. When there are 100 billion solar systems in our galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe, rare can still mean lots of stuff. But it's a big galaxy, and, it's, and things are very far apart. And even if you, I, I like to point out the, 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 the daunting task. So let's say you were on another star system, which had, has to be less than about 100 light years away, if, if, you, if you want to have any evidence that we're around because we've been emitting radio signals for maybe 100 years. But before that, there's no evidence of intelligent life on Earth particularly because um, we're not emitting signals. But even if someone told you to look at that star over there and then look at the third rock from that star and you'll find life, even then, if you think about it, it would be, over the history of our galaxy, the probability of doing so of finding our existence, even then, less than 1 in 50 million. Why? Because the galaxy is t t about 12 billion years old. Our Earth is 4.5 billion years old. You could imagine an advanced civilization that watched the Earth from its formation 4.5 billion years ago. And when, during that time interval, if they were monitoring us and knew, and knew exactly what to look for, there's only a 100-year period in which they would have been able to find anything. So even if they knew where to look, at a random time in the history of the Earth, the probability of finding life on Earth by that kind of signal is small. But that's if they knew what to listen for. I, I remember I gave up watching TV when, when cable came on and, and there were like 200 channels and I, and I could never find the program I was looking for, right? In, in the real world, you gotta wonder, okay, so there's frequencies, but there are an infinite number of frequencies to, to use, so you can guess. Are they using the hydrogen lines? Or, you know, people, SETI people, try and think of what would a, intelligent civilization do if they knew other civilizations were intelligent, where would they look for? But if with an infinite number of frequencies, you have to scan a huge number of frequencies looking for a signal. And SETI tried to do that with the limits of the computer technology that was available. Now computers are evolving dramatically. But so that's even, you don't, we don't know what to look for. We don't know what to listen for. We don't know where to look. It makes the task of even without worrying about visitation, of finding evidence for intelligent, extremely small. Now, it's so important, it's so important from a cultural perspective and also a scientific one, that it's worth doing. I don't think it's worth government money on, but I'm very happy that billionaires are spending their money on it, and I was involved in, in such things, because it's great that private money is intrigued enough, and Yuri Milner and more recently another, another uh, rich guy gave about $200 million to a project to look for extraterrestrial intelligence. But we should see, we should realize that even if it exists, it's extremely unlikely that we'll find it. And Carl Sagan knew that too. It's, 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 a, it's a remote possibility. And, and if we don't find it, as he said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The most likely thing is if intelligence exists in the universe, and I do think it does, that we will probably never know about it, which is tr sad for me personally, because obviously I'd like to, to know about it. And 
And um, anyway, I'll start with that. We can talk about the Fermi paradox. We can talk about a whole bunch of other stuff if you want. But sure. No, I, I, I think one of the most interesting ideas, and I think it was Timothy Ferris who coined mm. the idea of a galactic internet, mm -hmm. the idea that civilizations, even if they never meet, might essentially put the sum total of their, their knowledge, their history, everything, out there, and that any civilizations with sufficiently advanced radio telescopes might essentially be able to find that, and therefore, even if they never encounter each other, learn about the existence of, of these other civilizations, and, and uh, hopefully learn things that they didn't know. So I think that's one exciting thing. The other, the other thing that I think, picking up on some of your, your remarks there, is, is um, yes, there are obviously immense challenges if intelligence extraterrestrials wanted to find us, but without wanting to kind of do a Star Trek on you and yeah. say, well, but what about warp drive and what about wormholes? Well, let's, I'm, I'm very but happy we, if you no, do a Star Trek thing on me. We can, yeah, 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 I'm not going to try and out yeah, Star Trek you. But yeah. what, I, what I will say is this. I mean, I, I, I think uh, history shows us that the rapid advances in technologies that, that we've, we've seen in certain areas. So, for example, um, faster than, uh, sorry, heavier than, heavier than air flight is comparatively recent in human history, but we've basically come from, you know, the, the Orville and, and, you know, the Wright brothers, the Wright flyer, to stealth fighters and such like in, in less than 100 years, and, and arguably space probes as well. In, in terms of seeing the universe, we've gone from just being able to look with the naked eye to being able to look through instruments like James Webb back to almost the dawn of, of time and, and see quasars and, and things that, that, you know, a few hundred years ago before the telescope, I mean, you know, all you could see was those little pinpricks in the sky. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know theoretically, we can get into this perhaps, how far ahead given given star formation and heavy elements, yeah. theoretically how far ahead of us another civilization could be? A billion years? Well, the first question is how long does intelligent civilizations survive? And if we're the only example we know of, you wouldn't give good odds for a billion year survival period but uh, for an intelligent civilization. Well, if, if we're an example. But, but let me, you hit on something um, with this, what you hit on is, is the hope of everyone. And, and, I was, and Travis demonstrated that misconception beautifully. When he talked about, we don't, the known, we don't know, there's known laws of physics and, and we don't know. And, and I'm a big proponent of that. My, my last book called The Edge of Knowledge is saying we don't know is the three most important words you can, you can say in science. But the biggest misconception people have about science is because there's a lot we don't know about the universe, we don't know anything. In particular, what we do know with it, with absolute certainty, is that the, the unknown physics cannot contradict the known physics. Whatever I learn about quantum gravity a billion years from now, if, there, if that's how long it takes to show that string theory, say, has anything to do with reality, which it probably doesn't. But anyway, um, it, it, a billion years from now, whatever I know about quantum gravity, if I take a ball and let it go at the surface of the Earth, it's going to fall. Whatever fundamental theories we have cannot contradict the theories that have survived the test of experiment. So, it's, so anything is fine when it comes to unknown physics, but when it comes to known physics, the unknown physics cannot contradict it. So when something appears to violate the known laws of physics, there's good reason to believe that it's not there. And because and, and, you know, there are lots of examples of that. People, it would amaze me, and I just read a book, I was looking today at a book I wrote 30 years ago called Beyond Star Trek, and, and I pointed out there, which I think is, people, one of the identifications of UFOs is that they don't behave like normal aircraft or spacecraft. They do things like right angle turns and, and, and you know, going twice the speed of sound and all that. I would argue the characteristic of any real alien spacecraft or aircraft would be that it would do exactly what, what normal aircraft and spacecraft do. Because 
because that's the way anyone who was reasonable would be designing things. If you wanted to make one of these, and I love how most of these uh, reports do have these great right angle turns instantly, which you'd never see. Well, let's just take some basic physics from Newton, which ha wasn't contradicted by Einstein, which isn't quanti contradicted by quantum mechanics, and certainly won't be contradicted by quantum gravity or whatever is learned about the universe that we don't understand. If you, let's say you're going twice the speed of sound, you make a right angle turn, what seems instantaneously, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt, the eye keeps an image for maybe a tenth of a second. So let's say it makes you a tenth of a second to do a right angle turn from the twice the speed of sound. Well, when you do that, you're gonna experience incredible g-forces, about at least 700 g's, which is equivalent to the force you'd feel in an aircraft if you, if you lost power and you fell to the ground from a, maybe a thousand feet, the instant of impact on the ground, you'd experience g-forces around that. Aircraft don't look good after that. Like, they don't. Now, you might say, well, they're made of advanced materials that we don't have. Okay. But the materials might survive, but the aliens wouldn't. Now, whatever we learn about, as I say, about gravity, about anything else, is not going to change that basic physics that you have to overcome to do that. Now, it's true that I suspect, and I was saying with a friend over dinner, that Quite likely, if you were really going to send spacecraft, and why would you, when in fact you can build a James Webb Space Telescope, you can scan the universe without traveling through it so much more effectively, so much more cheaply, and scan the whole galaxy instead of devoting to take a spacecraft to travel near the, the speed of light from a nearby star to here, a spacecraft that could hold a mass of you or me, would require something like the power output of a star, okay, if, you, if it had its fuel on board. Why would they spend all of that incredible amount of energy, even if an advanced civilization could harness it, just to come all the way here and abduct psychiatric patients of some Harvard psychiatrist and do kinky experiments? It just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem worth it. So, uh, uh, but the point is, you can't, even if you could harness it, you can't overcome the fact that that's the amount of energy that's required because it's basic physics that, that is tested. And that means, as I say, whatever we don't understand can't contradict that. So I do worry when people say, well, you know, these civilizations are really advanced. If they're really advanced, they probably, if they exist, would do what we're doing now, which is learn that the best way to, instead of taking resources and going to one object, for which, again, if you're more than 100 light years away, you never even know has civilization in it, when you can scan the whole galaxy and look for life, or listen for signs of intelligent life, it's much more effective. And, and finally, the, I think the most likely thing, if a civilization did live a billion years long, yes, a, a, an intelligent civilization that was so much more advanced than us, it's, to me it's quite likely that they would, what they would precisely do is not have any interest whatsoever in our existence, or particularly in revealing their own existence. They would probably you know, be staring at their navels and going, oh, it's it, because they would already, there'd be absolutely nothing to be learned from our existence and, and be of no interest then. But so psychologically, I'm going to understand it, from the laws of physics, there's, there's no good likelihood that you could ever have a spacecraft that would travel at near light speed that's large enough to embody significant aliens. And moreover, the final thing I just want to say, I want to throw out all these tidbits, what always amuses me is flying saucers. Why would you, if you're traveling from a, even a nearby star, 99.999% of the time of your voyage is traveling in space. Why would you build an object that's precisely designed to be aerodynamic in the atmosphere of, an, of, a, of a planet that you don't even know about? You design a flying saucer because it's nice, you know, we all have frisbees and they work in our atmosphere, but it wouldn't be at all useful for, for traveling in, for, for the bulk of your travel. And so thinking about why things would behave aerodynamically for an object, look at the, look at the lunar excursion module if you're as old as you and me. Um, for young people, we went to the moon. We really did go to the moon. And, um, and there was nothing less aerodynamic than the lunar excursion module. It was the ugliest thing in the world. Why? Because you didn't need it to be aerodynamic because you were, it, it was working in space. And so one has to think about some of those things, and I just want to throw out a few. Sure. No, I think there were some really interesting points there, and I, I, I want to pick up on a few and make a, mm. a, a, a few of my own. I guess 
One of the interesting philosophical questions about this is, is relates to um, the nature of altruism and, and whether altruism, true altruism exists or whether there's always a hope of a quid pro quo. Because I think in considering the extraterrestrial question, in, as the power dynamic would be if we're interacting with more advanced civilizations, the question would become, would they be altruistic in terms of doing the heavy lifting for us? And, and so that's something I'd like to, to throw out. I mean, I do think, I, I do actually think that even a, a civilization way more advanced than us would still be interested in us for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think that to, to really advanced civilizations, newly emerging civilizations might be quite interesting. They might be wondering, are they going to make the same mistakes that we made? Not, not Star Trek. Are they going to kind of find a new, different path? Are they going to surprise us? Um, and, and so I, I think that's one thing. I think we, as hopefully quite intelligent life, are interested in arguably less intelligent life, i.e. we're fascinated by nature. And, and so you know, intelligent, advanced extraterrestrials might, might be very interested in, in us from that perspective. And, and also, of course, let's not be too human-centric about this, extraterrestrials might value biodiversity and might be fascinated by all sorts of things about life on Earth, not necessarily just intelligence, but beauty and, and you know, utilitarian design. And, and such like. So I think there you are... You see, the problem with that argument... I have to interrupt for a second. I, love, I buy all of what you're saying. But the problem with the argument is it's like having your cake and eat it too. You say there's a civilization that's a billion years more advanced. That's a billion years is a long time, okay? And that means if there is such a civilization, and if they really do have capabilities of knowing about our existence, and that means... And, and that really implies if, that we're not special. There aren't just two forms of life. That means the galaxy is kind of teeming with life. And that means that the, such a civilization is aware of lots of different life in, in the galaxy. And there's absolutely nothing, and presumably, unless we are, unless you violate the suggestion that we're typical, if we're, unless we're incredibly atypical for some reason that's hard to believe since life evolved on Earth about as soon as the laws of physics allowed it to, so it doesn't seem like it's, it's that. So the point is that there's a galaxy teeming with life. Why in such a galaxy would this particular planet, which may be hard to get to, it's in a remote corner of the galaxy, be particularly interesting compared to all the other thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of other civilizations that such a supposedly advanced civilization would be aware of? Uh, and so, once again, I think it's, it's very um, solipsistic for us to assume that not that they wouldn't be interested in studying us in the same way that we were, aren't, would be interested in studying biosignatures on other planets, but to devote the remarkably, unbelievably expensive resources and time, because you're not traveling faster than light, no matter what, even with warp drive, and we can talk about that, even warp drive doesn't get you faster than light. Um, why would that, those kind of resources be devoted to come here and then to hide and crash in Roswell, New Mexico, or do kinky experiments, or do nothing of interest? Uh, it, it, you know, it just doesn't add up. I'm, I'm, less, I'm less wedded to the idea of uh, extraterrestrials coming here and abducting oh. people and probing them than I am to the idea of sending out fleets of, of probes mm -hmm. and, and having those probes effectively gather, gather data yeah. on, on planets. And I think if, if we were looking for signs of intelligent life in our solar system, that's what I would be looking for, probes. And, um, you know, I, I would use the analogy of, I suppose, our pioneer and voyager probes and, and say, look, I, I know that we have not directly aimed them at, say, Proxima Centauri. Mm. And if we had, they would take about, what, 75,000 years to get there? Yeah. I, I think at... At, and assuming, at, at assuming we can never go any faster than, say, Pioneer or Voyager speed. Now, I think we can do better well, than that. Me, I was involved in such a project well, called Star, 
breakthrough startup funded by a Russian billionaire named Yuri Milner. Yuri Milner, Yuri Milner. Right, Stephen right. Hawking and I and a bunch of other people were involved in it. And, um, and, the, and I agree with you that if you were going to do more than just take in information, you would send up probes, not beings, okay? Mm -hmm. But the project we wanted to do, because it was the only, even then, and actually after years of studying it, I became more and more convinced it's, impl it's implausible rather than plausible. But when we started to do it, the idea was that what you could imagine plausibly sending at 20% the speed of light to Proxima Centauri, so it would take 20 years to get there instead of five, which is in human life, with a little, and it could transmit back, so it's another you know, five years to get back. So in 25 years from the time we launch one or many of these things, you might actually get a picture of, 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 of planets from, okay. But the problem is, what we, sh what we did was consider a one gram probe, because that was the largest object you could imagine sending with, at any reasonable fraction of the speed of light, but an instrument, and potentially get a signal for. It turns out to be incredibly implausible to even do that. So there may be probes, but the se only sensible probes would be microscopic inside because mass is the enemy of, sp of space travel. Mass, mass is literally the en enemy, and the, m the more advanced you are, the smaller you can, you, can, you can produce things. So if there were probes, they'd be traveling through space, and they wouldn't be in, in flying saucer-sized things. They'd be microscopic in size because you... Why? Because you could do it, and the cost of doing it would be infinitely less than the cost of sending a big, heavy thing. And if you're really smart, you can do a lot with the smaller thing. So why build the bigger thing? I, I just want to go back to my uh, Voyager and okay. Pioneer okay. example for a moment. And I, I just want to hypothesize and, and throw this out as a scenario. Imagine that we had uh, pretty much pointed Voyager and, um, and, and Pioneer at Proxima Centauri. And imagine, just bear with me on this, imagine there's a civilization on a planet um, orbiting that star. And 75,000 years from now, Voyager mm -hmm. comes into the atmosphere and crashes. And the government at Proxima Centauri, the military intelligence community, gather it up, as, as is quite likely, and they say, what the heck's this? And some locals saw it come down, and um, the government spirits it away to a uh, a place, and they start doing some experiments on it, and and then all the locals say, "Hey, we saw we saw a strange object come down and crash. I think it came from another star system." And then the scientists on Proxima Centauri say, "No, no, that's crazy. That would never happen." But actually, it did. I'm well, just throwing well, okay. that scenario a, out it, there. Let, let, okay, let's take your scenario and explain why um, why it's it's not going to happen. It because, might. No, no, because it's really interesting to realize that what it's hard to imagine is how big and how empty our galaxy is. Let me give you, let me give you the likelihood that Voyager or any random probe that's sent out randomly would hit anything is essentially zero. And to, give, to put that in perspective, the Andromeda galaxy is heading right towards us at 100 kilometers per second. Pretty big object. There's 100 billion stars in that galaxy. And so it'll hit the Milky Way galaxy. It'll, collide with the Milky Way galaxy in about five billion years, okay? When that happens, the likelihood that any two objects will hit from that galaxy will hit another, uh, anything in our galaxy, except that the very center of our galaxy is almost zero. You've got a hundred billion stars aiming at our galaxy. The likelihood that anything hits anything else is almost zero because most of our galaxy is empty space. So it's true. That possibility is a wonderful thought, mm. but if you ask what's the likelihood of it, mm. the likelihood is so small that to be essentially zero. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means it may be fun to think about, but it isn't happening. Well, in my scenario, I was saying we deliberately aimed it okay, there. Okay, 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 that's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, but if we, that, 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 was, that was what I meant. Okay, but then you'd know, you need to know, of course, where to deliberately aim it. And what we're going to do, and what we try to do, is if we're going to deliberately aim at something, we'll probably aim it at the nearest star system that might have a habitable planet, unless we find a biosignature. And as you say, if we don't find biosignatures in, in the nearest 100 light years, then you're not talking about 75,000 years, you're talking about a few million years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so nothing's impossible, but the likelihood of doing that 
rather than, for example, sending a signal, which is mm. much more effective, travels at the speed of light, it's cheap, it's, it's almost free. We could detect a light bulb on Jupiter, on, on Pluto, if, it, if there was one. And so why, why do that if you're really, if you're, if, if you're convinced there's intelligent life and you're not just pro interested in probing a potential biosystem, the first thing you'd probably do is, is send a signal. Mm. And, and so I think sending objects is the last alternative and it's, and it, in, a, in a universe that lasts a long enough time, it could happen eventually. But you're right, it has to be patient and you have to say, the results of this experiment are going yeah. to come in after our civilization is long gone, perhaps. Um, so anyway, the point is that I'm not saying any of it's impossible, but you have to think about how plausible it is. And I think sure. if you do that honestly, you say it's less likely than other alternatives. Yeah, I, I mean, I come back to the scenario that what I said about low probability, high impact. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, Michael Shermer, yeah. I, I think, uh, gave, gave an example. I'm sure it's an old saying, I, I can't remember whether he coined it or somebody else, but he said if you, you know the one, if, if you hear hoof prints, uh, hoof, hoofs outside your, your door, mm. think horses, not zebras. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, that's fine, and 99.9% and of the time it will be horses, but occasionally you read the story about zoo animals escaping, mm -hmm. and so it can be a zebra. And, and so my, my point with all this is, is that even if it is low probability, the, the high impact, the high consequence makes it worth doing. And I mean, I, I am very pleased that we're having this discussion. I wish more scientists like you would come on board and, and at least talk about it. And I am glad, I should say, a shout out to Professor Avi Loeb um, and the Galileo Project. And Avi was on the Starshot Project with me too. Right. And, and what I like about Galileo Project, and I think that one of the problems with UFOs and scientists was, for, for years, people in the UFO community would say, I want more scientists to get involved with this. But the question back, was, which was a good question, is, well, what kind of scientists? What field? Yeah. I, I mean, who do you want? Do you want aeronautical engineers? Do yeah. you want theoretical physicists? Do you want cosmologists? Do you, who do you want? Galileo Project, by having a multidisciplinary approach, is, is trying to cover all the bases. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, and get a lot of publicity. And, but happily, just using private money. Because no peer-reviewed government scientific agency would devote money to that because it's not worth spending public funds on. Moreover, as you know, Avi has achieved a lot of notoriety by, and I've known Avi for many years, and is a very good scientist who, who throws a lot of darts out, and, uh, and, 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 and anyway, I won't go there. But, um, but the point is, as you probably know, the first notoriety was claiming that an object was an extraterrestrial, was, a, was evidence of an extraterrestrial civilization, which is just not the case, as other scientists have shown pretty conclusively. But, it, you know, asking the question, could it be, is different than making the claim that it is. And I do worry about um, making such claims. They get a lot of notoriety, they allow you to write best-selling books and all the rest, but it's not science. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to come back on the government money point yeah. because that's quite important. Yeah. Um, after I did the UAP job at the Ministry yeah. of Defense, I actually did a, a, a financial policy mm -hmm. job. And one of the good things about UAP research in government is that a lot of stuff can be done pretty much at no additional cost uh -huh. because, of course, a lot of the things you need to research and investigate UAP from within government already exist and already funded. So you are, you are not necessarily having to spend much new money because what you're doing is piggybacking all the things you need, like, for example, your military radar mm -hmm. systems, uh, space fence, um, the, the intelligence community imagery analysis mm -hmm. uh, resources and capabilities, all that exists and is funded. So I, I, I hope that Congress doesn't say, hey, this is a waste of no, money because there's not it, too much money being spent. Yeah, but the point, yeah, but what I want to, you're absolutely right. 
Because, I mean, the military has an infinite budget that spends a lot of money on things that are much less interesting and much less useful. So I have no problem with the military spending or the government spending that kind of money. But you said, why don't more scientists come on board? The point is, the, the, the Defense Department has resources to investigate things and use the technology. If you want scientists who are currently doing other projects, take, take government money to do other things that is much more likely to have positive results and say, let's take the money from those things and devote it to this, that's a very different thing. That's why you're not seeing many people from outside, from the outside scientific community coming in, because they're all do something that is much more likely to produce something. But the military can devote resources, and, I'm, and I perfectly think should, because not, because for many reasons, but, but as your department pointed out, for defense reasons. The UAPs may not, are, are, are not likely to be extraterrestrial, but it's important from a defensive purpose for an advanced civilization or advanced, you know, a, a, a technological society like ours to be able to know what, what is happening in our, in our airspace, to know it better. And I think what, what, the, what the NASA report said and other reports are saying is we need to do a better job instead of having these anecdotal reports from people, you know, with their, with their iPhones, and it is kind of amazing with, a, with five billion people having iPhones on the planet that not a single one has ever taken a picture of a real UFO. Uh, so, but, but the government has the resources to do that much more systematically and should do it, and to the extent that it doesn't infringe on national security, should be public about it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the former uh, director of national intelligence uh, did did say that there is satellite data on UAP. And, yeah. and now, how much of that is ever going to be declassified for everyone else to, to evaluate, I don't know. I mean, I, th I, think, I think we have, we have obviously some differences mm. here, but we have found some common ground. Oh, yeah, I don't sure. know how we are it's for time. It's always good to investigate things. What, what time do you think we should well, throw to the audience? Well, I was just going to suggest that after you said whatever you're going to say, that we should go to the audience. Yeah, should Travis, we do that? Travis said an hour, and I, I want to go much less, but we're all, we've been pretty well to an hour. Take off his 40-minute introduction, and we've went, and yeah. we're done. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're there. So, yeah, I was, yeah. was going to suggest we go to the audience, because the questions will be much more interesting. Yeah, let's do that. How do you want to do that? It's a small group. Yeah. Do you have a microphone? Or? The audience mic is just there, guys. Okay. So, so let, let's do that. But thanks. I mean, I think, yeah, I think the idea was to raise the issues in different ways instead of resolving them. And let's I think give them have. a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. Now, who has a pressing question? It, any, have we, I don't know. I, I don't want to scare anyone off. Wait, the New Hampshire person in the very back. Um, and uh, there's a very, I don't know if that's a latecomer Great. who's just come in, who, who likes to make a special entrance. And I see her. But anyway, uh, okay. Hello. Come on down, as, they, as Monty Pike Hall used to say, I think. Okay. Hello, Ethan. And, I know uh, you brought your, now I know you're a scientist because you're wearing a white coat. It's actually, I actually <laughs> okay. am. I'm, I'm okay. an experimental scientist. Okay. Uh, we have a research lab in Hawthorne, New Jersey called sure. Falcon Space. We're looking uh. into uh, p potential propulsion systems to how these craft work. And you asked a couple very legitimate questions. Thank you. Why aren't scientists involved? Well, uh, there's actually an organization that's been going on three years now called APEC, the Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference. Mm -hmm. And we have PhDs, scientists from all walks of life, mo a lot of theoretical physicists. Uh, many I think of I spoke at the first one, by the way, probably when you were a little baby. But anyway. Go I, I, I actually created it. Yeah, so okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you yeah, did, I mean, it was NASA on my NASA did have an advanced propulsion program. And, uh, and, and for alternative propulsion, and I, got, I was involved in... in Richard in Eskridge Af and uh, in, in, out Brandenburg. Out of Cleveland, actually, believe it or not. So. Oh, they had one down in Huntsville, Alabama, yeah, yeah. too. Okay, anyway, sorry. And uh, some of that stuff never got published, but I, yeah. I went down there and checked that out. Um, so some of your questions uh, about why are they uh, saucer shape, uh -huh. um, or how can they do a 90-degree turn mm. without turning everyone into... Uh, salsa. Into salsa on the yeah. side. Well. Have you ever given any thought of where inertial mass comes from? Yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And you don't really have an answer yet, right? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean universal mass? Uh, no, not universal, uh, inertial mass. Inertial mass? Yes. Okay. Well, what inertial mass inertial? is the reason why they'll get turned into salsa. Well, you mean in the sense that, it, that 
I don't want to have a physics debate here, but in the sense that, uh, you know, inertial mass being the thing that responds to gravitational force. Um, and also... As opposed to, you know, there's rest mass, there's, there's rest energy, there's, and it is a remarkable fact that, the, that, that there are different ways of considering the mass of an object, but inertial mass is what responds to gravity. Okay, and so, so we do understand that in the context of general relativity. What is its origin? Well, it turns out, if you want to think of the Higgs field as giving inertial mass to elementary particles, then it comes from the Higgs field. Okay, maybe there's a way to get rid of that. Have you, have you heard there of is. that? There is, there is. All you'd have to do is heat a system up to a temperature of roughly a billion, billion, billion degrees what if you did and the opposite? locally, which would require more energy than is available probably from, from the sun in its lifetime to do that locally. And, you, and in a small region, you might be able to make the Higgs field go to zero. Yeah. But what if you did the opposite? What if you oriented the subatomic particle spins? What, what was that? Uh, there's a process called dynamic nuclear orientation where you can orient subatomic particle spins and make uh, matter weightless. There, well, like, okay. that's, that, that's something that we're working on. We don't on. have that discussion. We, you, you don't, and we haven't. Okay, but anyway, we can debate about that later. I know of, uh, of these wonderful experiments where people tried to rotate something and claimed that they reduced the inertial mass, which weren't reproducible and were, in fact, shown not to be reproducible. I, I'm quite aware of that community. And uh, look, I, I, I think it's... Here's, here's the problem, and it's what I told NASA. This is not an engineering problem. It's not as if engineers are going to design some, new, design some new propulsion system. It's fundamental physics. And it's fundamental physics at the level that we, that we, we don't have the capability of, that, that's at the level of, of what people like me are doing, at the edge of theoretical physics. And so it's not as if we're going to put a bunch of engineers in a laboratory and make an advanced propulsion system that involves physics that we don't yet understand. It's just way beyond, it's like, it's like asking, it's like asking a, a, a dolphin and saying, okay, we need to make a new radio transmission system. I mean, they don't know yet about electromagnetic waves. So it's not an engineering problem. At this point, trying to understand things like warp drive, which I can argue is impractical anyway and won't work. Um, it's already been achieved in Omaha, Nebraska. They got like five it, pounds. Of it, 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 anyway, okay, it's good. You keep working on it. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude, but we, you know, no sense probably in this, in this group. But let me say that as a lot of people, when I have debates with people about evolution, they say scientists are closed-minded, they don't want to, you know. And, and what people don't realize is that every scientist goes into the work each day wanting to prove their colleagues wrong. Because that's how you get well-known. So it's not to say, we, let's have a little, little handshake. We'll, we'll never open our, our minds to anything new. Or if there is, we won't let anyone know. It's the exact opposite. So what I'm saying to you is that the, the reason I'm poo-pooing what you've talked about is that people like me have looked at this stuff and would love it to be true. Just like I'd love there to be evidence of... I mean, it would be amazing if there really were some divine creator who did something. It would be wonderful to have evidence of that. There isn't. Okay, and, and so, but if the stars aligned tonight and I looked up and I saw an Aramaic, if I could read it, I am here, uh, hey, I'd be the I first one to can. buy it. That'd be great. If I had evidence of some, of, or I knew of anyone who had evidence of something like that, I'd be the first person to be working on it. Well, but you're welcome no, to come to the lab. It's a half stuff, an hour from here. I know. but when Half you look an hour at, drive. But when you look at the peer-reviewed stuff, what you see is that there's nothing there. So I encourage there's, you there's to There's trying... lots of stuff there, okay. and we have lots of peer review okay. papers that we would love to okay. share with you. Great. Don't, don't share with me, but, but publish it. <laughs> uh, also, okay. your, your, uh, your friend Richard Feynman famously said, it doesn't matter how great your theory is or how, how smart you are. If it disagrees with experiment, it's, it's wrong. wrong. Absolutely. Right. And we do experiments. Good. Keep doing experiments. I encourage you to keep doing it. And I hope, I sincerely hope you prove me wrong. I really, really do. I earnestly hope you prove me wrong because that would be fascinating. So okay. keep, keep it up. Thank Don't you. spend public money on it, but keep it up. Okay. Okay, okay thanks. And, and thanks for having the bravery to... I'm sorry, do you want to... I, I kind of took over. Oh,
Hi, thank you. Um, you know what, the Earth has been through so many traumatic things. I mean, we had, uh, you know, a number of times we get, uh, uh, we get struck by something from outer mm -hmm. space and dust goes in the air mm -hmm. and it kills everything. And well, that could happen again, right? And mm -hmm. We can send out all these signals and by the time somebody actually reads it, the Earth could be, de everybody on it could be dead again. And it seems like we're four million years, uh, four billion years old. Within that time, we've been through a number of these. What are the chances are, because we continue to go through this, now we're gonna do it to ourselves between pollution and bombs <laughs> that we can, you know, like, What's it will intelligent like a, life ever last long enough to talk to each other? Know. I guess that's my but, question. Yeah. But, you know, but, and I'll, I'll say one thing, and then I think you, because you've been involved in the government of this too, but I think the point is that we can at least try and anticipate what the problems are, and as a presumably intelligent technological situation, as Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. So one of the projects that the government, that's somewhat related to looking for UAPs in a different sort of way, that is really worth funding and is really important, is a project that was just involved with, which is looking for near Earth or, or, or objects that are gonna collide with the Earth. That we need to do because it's gonna happen. Now the probability of a life destroying asteroid hitting us about once every 100 million years, but you don't need that. And as you probably know, NASA sent a mission called DART yep. to intersect an asteroid to see if you could deflect it. And that's the kind of thing that an intelligent civilization should be doing in developing the tools so that we can get a good idea within, within maybe a 10 year advance notice of any large object, kilometer size or more, that might impact on the Earth. But, there, but, but your point is well taken. The universe in every way is trying to kill us. We're not doing a very good job of not trying to kill ourselves. And so the likelihood that we'll be around in a long time is not great, especially when you consider that 99.9% .9 of the species that have existed on Earth are already extinct. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Richard Gott, who's at, at, at Princeton, has a, a, a neat prediction, which is basically things survive on average for about as long as they've existed. So, you know, you could ask how long will, will hominids survive? And it's, you know, it's not, there's no perfect, it's, it's just a rough statistical argument. But you're right, we're not gonna be around, but, we, but at least we have the potential to have foresight enough to try and be around, and if we look at the right problems and think about them correctly and devote resources, we have a greater probability. Will we do that? Well, look at climate change. I mean, it's, anyway, I don't know if you want to say anything uh, else. Yeah, yeah, I do, because I, it's, it's an interesting question because it speaks to one of the elements in the Drake equation, um, i.e. the longevity of civilizations. How long, how long is a civilization on the air, so to speak? And, and absolutely, we face a number of existential threats. Um, the, the catastrophic impact of a, a comet or, or asteroid. And I was actually one of the first members of a UK lobby group, group called Space Guard UK, which, which existed to lobby uh, and raise awareness on, on the, that very issue. And, and it is extremely important. It's, it's another very good example of when I use that phrase, low probability, high impact. That's the best I mean, example, yeah. low probability, high impact. Literally and, and, and metaphorically. Literally, literally yeah, impact. Literally, yeah. and, and yes, it is, uh, the, I did not invent this saying. Uh, somebody um, came up with it, and, and you, you probably know, it. maybe it was you. Yeah. Uh, I'll take uh, credit for it. Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> you, you can, well, you can at least tell me who it was if you know. Yeah. It, it, somebody said, uh, uh, the ultimate tragedy would be if we, as the first generation aware of such a threat and able to do something about it, fell victim to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the longevity of a, a civilization is an important part of the Drake equation, and, and it's important for reasons of human survival. And I, I actually agree with Elon Musk on this. At the moment, we have all our eggs in one basket, and if we can do anything to uh, mitigate that risk by spreading out a bit, uh, let's do it. Because whether it's, whether it's comet or asteroid impact, whether it's nuclear war, uh, whether it's uh, some new uh, global pandemic, disease X, uh, but we, <laughs> yeah, we face a lot. In, in the long run, I agree with Elon. In the short run, I certainly don't. In the, I mean, it's ridiculous to send a group of people to die on Mars. But, <laughs> but although, you know, people want to do it. But... Um, uh, um, I was saying, I forget if I was saying to Jerry who was here, but early, I, if we're going to go on space missions, one-way missions to Mars are much more, are exponentially cheaper than round trips. Oh, and yeah. I, was, I was amazed when I wrote a piece for the Times maybe 15 years ago on about a one-way one mission to Mars 
that I polled engineers and that I met, everyone was willing to do it. I, I think that, that the, in the long term, it's absolutely right. Human civil, I do think the future of humanity in the long term, in, and I mean long term, is to, is to diversify. But it's right now, if you want to look at places to live, that li living at the bottom of the ocean, which is a lot easier to get to, is, is probably better than, living on, than imagining creating a group of people who are going to live and survive on the surface of Ma Mars. In fact, I was just trying to explain to someone again, I can't remember the next thing to do, in the long term for the survival of humanity, it'd be much easier to move the Earth. And there's simple ways to move the Earth. So when the sun becomes a red giant, I can imagine moving the Earth out to the region of Mars. And, those, and the Earth is already habitable, so Mars isn't. But anyway, I think, I think um, the, hedging our bets, not hedging our bets in the long run is, is a good idea. But I think the idea that right now we have an urgent need to, spend, to put people on Mars, other than for adventure, I have no problem with adventure, but humanity doesn't have an urgent need right now to put people on Mars. We have an urgent need to deal with some things like climate change and other things that we do have the technology to address. And sure, send some astronauts to Mars and have, have fun doing it, but it's not something that's going to globally, in the near term, and I mean in this century, affect our civilization in any, in any robust or useful way, except spend a lot of money. <laughs> what? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but it's like, but the idea is like, it's, but moving the Earth, instead of doing other things, is like sending a flying saucer instead of a one gram object. <laughs> There's much, you can deal with global warming in ways that are much less intense than moving the Earth. It's not a technology, the problem with global warming is not technology, it's politics. Okay, so, and that, and that may be a much harder problem to solve than, it, 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 anyway. Hey, just one comment, I just, um, I was thinking, hopefully, if there is intelligent life that comes visit us, they're not like the worst of us. Because yeah, we'll, we'll really you know, be in trouble. You know. it, it is worth, it, and that's why, you know, Stephen Hawking used to like to say things that get a lot of attention. But he, he did raise the question, should we let people, let beings know of our existence? Because while I absolutely agree with you, you'd think that a civilization that's advanced enough would be more like Star Trek than, than, than Terminator or something. And, but if you look at the history of human civilization, every time two cultures have interacted, and one is much more advanced than the other. The original didn't last very long. So that may not be a universal rule. And if you're smart enough and a billion years old, and that maybe, maybe you don't do that. But it certainly is worth thinking about. Yeah, and, and just a final postscript on that last comment. Um, yeah, I too hope they don't send the worst of them. But I think, like us, they, they will send people with the right stuff. So mm -hmm. I hope they send the best of them. Yeah, the, and, uh, and yeah, anyway. The explorers. Yeah. yeah, the explorers who, yeah, The absolutely. adventurers. Yeah. All right, uh, where's the microphone zone? Here it is. Uh, first question, I have two questions. One, what if, like, sound, yeah. what if what we receive, like, communication, like, if they send out a communication, what if it's a distress call that we're too late to receive and we have to prepare for a warning. That's just far-fetched, like sci-fi. And the other is, am I not being picked up a microphone, or? What do I think of what? Um, there, we go. there we go. Cool. What do, you, what do you think of if we get a dis uh, distress call from like extraterrestrials or some oh. other societies, and we have to react to that? That's one. Like, what if they created a artificial intelligence or a machine that wiped them out that is spreading like uh, the Borg or something like that? Yeah, well, the, those are all interesting science fiction questions. Yeah, again, that's and And, and the point, uh, obviously, not... as I think, he, I think Nick pointed out, uh, but I mean, if some civilization sent out a distress call, you're absolutely, it's absolutely true that it's already too late by the time mm -hmm. we've heard it, okay? Um, but the, the other thing, uh, I mean, like the Borg, I mean, the Borg are, to me, the most interesting alien species in the civilization that assimilate other technologies. But, but the, ga the, you, the galaxy is a big place. Let me, let me you're aware of the Fermi paradox, I assume. Yes. But, so the, one of the big things that Fermi asked when he argued there wasn't intelligent civilizations is if they are there, why haven't, we, why haven't they communicated with us? Because you could work out from the laws of physics that, it is, that if you could develop 
a reasonable, even, even not light speed, but even just at mere rocket ship rates in a 12 billion year old galaxy, and every time you arrived at a civilization, you sent out two more probes, and you, you could, he could imagine that you could basically more or less almost have probes throughout the galaxy. Why hasn't that happened? I think there are lots of arguments for why that easily would not happen. Yeah, but one, but the point is that it's just not likely that, that it's, it's just a big, big galaxy. And so um, even something randomly moving around at, 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 at point out, it's going to take 75,000 years to get to the nearest, you know, nearest star. And that's just in our neighborhood mm -hmm. of a few light years away. And the galaxy is 100,000 light years across. And so, um, I mean, it's not, those are things that are possible, but I don't think are worth worrying about. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not probably. I, Do you have any? any uh, uh, no, I, I mean, just to reiterate that point, yeah, absolutely. If we got a distress signal from Proxima Centauri, when we got it, um, it's already four and a half years since they sent it. And, and obviously, if it's, if it's from the other side of the galaxy, uh, yeah, that civilization might have mm -hmm. gone extinct by then. And, and that's, that's an interesting point about the SETI program and, and the possibility of picking up radio signals. Those might be signals from civilizations that aren't there anymore. And so it's just, it's just kind of, you know, fingerprints in the sky, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's why Star Trek invented warp drive, because it's just, it just wouldn't make for a good episode for, for, you know, Kirk to call back to Starfleet Command and get and, and, and get a response 50,000 years later. It just, the dramatic tension would go away. Exa exactly. But uh, did you have a second question? Yes, I did. Um, second question is, why would, like, going along your lines of, it, why would they spend resources sending out objects when they could send microscopic probes and figure it out, just like research-wise? Why are we, how do I phrase this? Why are we still looking more so towards what if it's extraterrestrial and not what if it's like an, a remnant that we have that we made in a previous existence? Like let's say there was a intelligent species before us that went extinct from like a mass chaos event or something and they left remnants in the geological findings that we could use to learn from. There's no evidence for that. I know no, there's no evidence for that. I'm just so, saying. I mean, like, you're, what if is a fine thing to ask. But it's, it's again, it's a what if. It's not really. But, you practical. know, your point is, look under every. There's there, there's a famous story. If you're if you're, the scientists often say if you, if you're a, a, a drunk coming out of a bar and you lose your keys, where do you look? You look under the lamp lamppost. Why? Not because it's likely under the lamppost, but it's the only place you're going to find it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what scientists tend to do is always try and look under the lamppost. Look at the things that are easiest to find and look for evidence of them. And, um, and uh, that's what we do, in, 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 given the yeah. resources at hand. And, um, but it is worth pointing out, and I've, I've, I don't know if I've written about it, but I certainly thought about it, that in a geological time scale, that almost everything disappears, right? There's subduction. So the, the, the surface continents of the Earth reformulate over, over periods of 100 million years or so. And so every, you know, e even after we destroy ourselves, all remnants of our existence on the surface of the Earth in the long run, even before the sun goes red giant, uh, is, are going to be erased be erased. Yeah, anyway. it's all, it's all going to be erased. That's yeah. my Way point. erased. I mean, underneath yes. the... Uh, it's going to be out, underneath it, and it's going to be reprocessed so there's and no, brought there's back not, up. There's, so there's not going to be any evidence. evidence of that anyway. But bottom line is that yeah, no matter, you know, people like to think they're ancient civilizations that predate yeah, ours that have at, technology. At, no but at evidence. At the point, there's not going to be evidence anymore because either it was swallowed up or it's not in our record anymore. Anyway, 2001 was a neat idea, but it was yeah. a neat idea. Do you have. Oh, no, I don't, I, I don't have yeah. anything on that. Uh, did you also write Physics of Star Wars? No, no. After the physics of Star Trek, there were a hundred books that came out. Okay, yeah, because well. I have physics of no, Star Trek. Star Wars physics doesn't have any Wars. Inter much interesting science in it. Star yeah, Trek did. No. Yeah, yeah. Star okay. I have physics of Star Trek, and that's why I came here, because I, I saw your name on the poster. I'm like, oh, I know the author. Yeah. yeah. There's a physics of Doctor Who as well, right? Uh, yeah, there's, after, believe me, there's, there's a yeah. lot. Yeah. All right, yeah. that's all. It, someone did want me to write the physics of Baywatch, which I thought would have been interesting. <laughs>
Anyway. Yes. How you doing, guys? Um, my question is more geared towards Nick, but you both good, can answer. Good. Ask, ask Nick. I was kind of curious to talk about like altruism. They would come to the planet, and um, what I find interesting about the way which you categorize aliens is, first of all, when we investigate like animals, we try to be incognito, right? We put things that look like them, that become indistinguishable to them from the environment. And I find a civilization that is billions of years old making such a kerfuffle and making us all see these objects that they're sending here just doesn't make any sense. And another thing that's interesting to me is how come every time throughout history, when we look at like these alien spacecrafts, they end up just mirroring the, either the artistic or art deco period of the time, whether it be the crashes at Roswell or War of the, War, War of the Worlds, or as we look at the newest alien movies with uh, the ginger lady, I don't remember her name, but it always seems to mirror the aesthetic period of the time, and that just doesn't seem to make sense to me, which is why it's like, it, does, it makes less sense to me that these things are actually alien in nature as opposed to just we see them and we imbue onto them our priors from Hollywood and society. I think that may be part of it. I mean, I think part of that gets into psychology and the idea that we can maybe only uh, describe things or that we tend to describe things in terms of things that we're familiar with. So we say, well, it was like an X. Um, if it's something new to us, because in a sense that's all we can say. I, so I think part of it is, is the idea of um, familiarity and, and such like. I, I mean, we can only have these sorts of speculative discussions from an anthropocentric point of view. And I mean, you know, in one sense that's, that's limiting because, because every time one gets into these sorts of discussions, you know, you, you get some people who say, well, if aliens come here, um, they would do this and they would do that, and, and we've only got the model of our own behaviors to go on. And, and the truth of it is, we don't really know what another civilization might think or what their agenda might be. We can make some reasonable is ish assumptions, I guess, but they are just assumptions. I mean, if somebody comes here, you could say, are they an explorer? Uh, they might be, um, but they might be here as a, like, a, you know, to, to mine resources and, and such. I mean, I take your point about the, uh, the animals, though, and I think that's interesting. And, and uh, yeah, without getting all sort of prime directive mm. Um, on, on you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously, when, you, when we do wildlife documentaries, the best of those documentaries are where the animals aren't aware of our presence and um, you, you see them naturally. However, on occasion, you know, you, you might be interested from a scientific view point in how they respond to a particular stimulus and you might provide that stimulus. I mean, I think you can argue these things round and around, but it takes you to some interesting territory, for sure. Let, let me add one thing about that, because I think you hit a big point about the cultural nature of this. UFOs, now UAPs, are a cultural phenomenon. Carl Sagan talked about this in his, in his last book, Candle and, Science is a Candle in the Dark. I forget the... That was the subtitle. I forget what the main title was. Demon Haunted World? Demon Haunted World? What, what, was it Demon Haunted World? Yeah, Demon Haunted World. Science is a candle dark. But he, what he pointed out in talking about UFOs, which was really interesting, is, what a, is that every epoch has had its own version. In the 19th century, it was fairies. It was, it, it, you know, people would see them in, in flower, little, little fair, you know, these little things that look like Tinkerbell. And, and, every, and, and, and once some people saw it, a lot of people saw it. And... It's kind of amazing that no one in the 19th century saw aliens with big heads that happen to be almost look exactly like the things that the first drawings of aliens that always seem to be seen again and again. And, and so it's, if, again, if you're an anthropologist, you might argue that there's as much evidence that UFOs are a product of our culture, or as Feynman said, a product of the known irrationality of humans rather than the unknown rationality of aliens. Each different era has had their own version of aliens. But it's kind of weird that, they, that, that, you know, that now all the reports, and there's incredible fascination, well, they're societal fads. And, I'm, and it, all the evidence that I can see is that the current fascination with UFOs is a societal fad. That's Thank you guys. Anyway. We got time for three quick ones, guys. Three, three quick ones. 
Good evening. Hopefully hey. this will be quick. Um, hey, Kevin. I think, Dr. Krauss, you've uh, spoken about this in some of your previous podcasts about uh, the dark forest uh, theory. Have either, have, are either of you familiar with that? The dark forest theory? You mean dark energy? No, dark forest where such that, um, and, and there was a Chinese uh, uh, science fiction writer called uh, Sijin Liu, I think is, that's his name. He created a, a really popular trilogy, I highly encourage everyone to read it, uh, called Supernova Era. One of the books was uh, The Dark Forest, where it talks about um, the philosophy where if, say, our planet sends out a signal for another entity to, to receive, that alien or other galaxy mm -hmm. entity, whatever, um, wouldn't want to be discovered. And you talk about altruism, where such that other, other species might not want to be discovered for fear that if we... Mm -hmm we might want to annihilate them. Well, so, that's what the, so, they, so they're going to so they're going to annihilate yeah. us first. That's the dark forest. He or she whatever it who who discovers the signal is going to strike first. So how would you what would you say to that where our signals maybe they go through some type of alien relay station or something and they get discovered we would be annihilated because we would be considered a threat to whoever discovered us. Well, I think, you know, it I can imagine people saying that, but we're not a threat. We can't, we're stuck here. We're essentially infinitely far away from any other civilization. We're, we're, if you list the threats, uh, again, if you're, an, if you're a military assessor and you list the possible threats, the likelihood that Earth is a threat to another alien civilization or vice versa is so far down the list that you better deal with the real threats first. But so their I philosophy think might be strike first and yeah. ask questions later. Let, let, me, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll quote Seth Shostak on, on mm -hmm. this from SETI. I mean, he, he said, look, we've been a communicable civilization, uh, a detectable civilization we've for decades. <laughs> and and um, he said, any civilization capable of threatening us is already aware of us. So this whole idea that we shouldn't be sending signals into space, it's too late anyway. Right. But yeah, we, we, we both no dark forest theory, and um, it's, it's one of the, I guess it's one of the many solutions to the Fermi paradox. Yeah, that you don't want to be, it's not, generally I would think not so much not wanting to be discovered, but not feeling it's necessary to communicate. But that does, I wanted to comment on the one thing you said. I think it's true that a lot of good nature theories have, series have people, you know, sitting in blinds. But if you actually look at the best science that's been involved in understanding how other species work, it's actually it, 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 interacting with them. And, 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 and actually experimenting and testing. And really, the, that's how we've learned about how biology, not just watching, but actually manipulating and doing experiments rather than just observations. Because experiments are generally better than observations. Right. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, one uh, clarification question on um, that amazing fact about the uh, light bulb on Pluto. Is that a literal light bulb on Pluto with all the background of the reflected sunlight, or is it basically an isolated light bulb at the distance of Pluto? Because I would think one is much easier to see than the other. And then basically related to that, what are the limits um, of distance where we could, with our best radio telescopes, detect um, an Earth-like planet using mid 20th century radio technology. Um, yeah, what is the best distance, provided that they're not sending out any signals in a directed manner, just sort of. Yeah, so it's prop going, yeah. fall, the intensity is falling off as one yeah, of the, a, square. A, mm -hmm. square of the distance. Well, of course, it depends a lot on the intensity of the signals, and people have, have done that. And, and let me talk about the light bulb first. Think, of course, as you point out, it's a vague statement. It depends what frequency range you're emitting in. If you're emitting 100, what, if you're emitting 100 watts of energy in a limited frequency range on Pluto, we could detect it over, over background easily. We could have with the Arecibo radio telescope when it was existing. No problem. So that's the... And it is amazing to think how sensitive radio telescopes are. The largest one now, now that Arecibo is gone is one in China. Um, and so... Detecting electromagnetic signals is unbelievably efficient, right? We can see photons, single photons, from the stars at 12 billion light years away. Or more, actually, more than 12 billion light years away, but light that was emitted 12 billion 
years ago. Now, when you say, what, what's the limit of detectability, you have to ask, what is the signal you're looking for? Mm -hmm. okay? We can probably detect spectral signatures of, of the atmosphere of planets to look for biosignatures in, in, in a, a region at least maybe a quarter of a, a thousand light years around us, maybe less, I don't know but the exact number. We could detect extreme less, signals in other galaxies. Yeah, that, that would give us less indication of intelligent life, but detecting yeah. sort of radio it, waves, radio it signals. It depends, but the whole thing, it depends. Are you yeah. emitting a signal at a given frequency? Or not, and that's what I, I meant by that. And if you are, we have to find the frequency. I, I'm saying, like, imagining it's sort of a, a, an Earth twin with mid 20th century technology, uh, that sort of radius. Signature. You know, would we detect the Star Trek I I signals from another, uh, another system? Mm -hmm. I haven't done the exact calculation, but I would expect that with, with our telescopes now, with that kind of power output, would be of order 100, several hundred light years, is what I bet. And in that region, there may be. There may be a thousand or ten thousand habitable planets. By habitable, I mean ones that may have liquid water on them. That doesn't guarantee habitability at all, and it's not even clear when we say habitable planets. And people should realize that because there's a lot of talk in the press about habitable planets. It's where people infer that there, there could be liquid water, but the Earth is of a habitable planet, and at various times in its history, it's been frozen solid on the surface about 600 million years ago. So even, we know so little that when people talk about habitable planets, you should, you should take that with a huge grain of salt. There may be no liquid water on the surface, and they may be uninhabitable for a huge number of reasons, primarily because most stars in our galaxy are much smaller than the sun. So the region, the region of habitability means the planet's much closer to the star. Fine, but the problem is those stars also have frequent outbursts that would likely vaporize water on the, uh, on the planet. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that you have to assume if you're going to assume habitability. But yeah, we could probably accidentally detect, maybe, if we knew exactly what to look for. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard part, maybe, within 100 to 1,000 light years. And just before you take the last question, by how many orders of magnitude is, is the square kilometer array radio telescope going to improve things? Well, again, it depends on what... The, uh, it, <laughs> Many orders of magnitude for the right frequency range, but the square kilometer range is, is looking at millimeter wavelength radiation designed to look at, at, at signals from the very early universe. Um, but um, once again, if, if, a, if a civilization were emitting in that range, you'd be able to detect it. Yeah, yeah, just like, um, but it'd have to be doing just right. Right. That's a good, it's a good point. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my main question was, we know that there's like many pressing issues here regarding climate change and global warming, and that is tangible. That is not something that we need to put any more research into knowing there's an issue about. Like, we know that's an issue. And I was wondering if, do you believe that um, the environmental impact of space travel, that it, that it um, causes, um, ca carbon emissions, do you think that that is worth it considering the benefits that we could get from space travel? Like, do you think that there are diminishing returns that come from um, the dangers of worsening t climate change that we are dealing with right now with space travel? I, I don't think that's the key issue, frankly. And, I mean, I remember back in the, before you were born in the days of Apollo, people saying, how, there's so many problems here on Earth why, why should we be spending billions of dollars going to the moon? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and people said that up in my own field originally, particle physics. Yeah. Why spend $10 billion on an accelerator when we have all these other pressing issues? If it was an either-or case, I would say it is, but it isn't an either-or case. Yeah. $10 billion is probably the, the Xerox costs of the Department of Defense, okay? And, and it, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's not real money. In terms of the, it's true that, that sending rockets up has an environmental cost. Mm -hmm. But I think in the grand scheme of things in terms of climate change, that, that, that is not a, that is not having, that stopping the space program would not have a significant effect. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the space program is, is, is impo important for learning about science. The space program not involving humans, most of the space program 
pretty well all the important science that we get from NASA doesn't involve human exploration of space. We haven't learned bupkis from the human exploration of space except how to keep humans alive in space. The important, the, you, can, you can send a, a rover to Mars for the same cost as making a movie about sending Bruce Willis to Mars. Yeah, okay. I, I, like, and so, I completely agree. But, but, you know, it is true that, you know, I just saw an article, maybe you did too, that, that yeah, Elon Musk, you know, hit the, the SpaceX program is, is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of carbon emission there, but yeah. I think, and the comparison of, of the global carbon emissions is not the first thing you, you'd want to attack, in my opinion. Yeah, when it comes to the, um, you know, uh, economic costs of space travel, I completely agree that even entertaining the conversation that it, it's too expensive. I think that's that's Nothing. ridiculous. I completely agree. But when it comes to that exact article, I was reading it. Um, that's what you know inspired me to ask my question. Um, plus, I'm a, a really big fan of yours, and I want to be able to tell my chemistry teacher like <laughs> yeah, on but Monday. you know, one of the things that can be said uh, that's really important is that anytime you push technology, new technologies, you discover things that are useful in other ways, mm -hmm. and and it's not the real reason to justify it. But, the, but when we're talking about, it's, I, would not, I would not be surprised if out of the space program in one way or another, some technologies arise, especially, for example, the space program is important for doing Earth monitoring mm -hmm. to, to, to see what's happening for the weather and everything else. Yeah. And so I, I guess my favorite quote from this involves uh, uh, Robert Wilson, who was the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, a particle accelerator, and when it was being built, the Congress, he testified before Congress, and they said, asked, will it help in the defense of the nation? And he said, no, but it'll help keep the nation worth defending. Yeah, it's and very inspiring that's indeed. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for the good question. All right, everyone, let's yeah. give a big round of applause to Lawrence Krauss and Nick Pope. Thank you Thank guys you. so that much. Was good. Was that, you, you yeah. fun? No, great. Okay. Yeah, that no, was good. We're going to have to do this again. Um, uh, thanks to everyone who watched on YouTube. Please hit the like button before you guys head out. Everyone in the audience, we're going to head into the lobby. We do have to be out by uh, 10 p.m. tonight, but we do have posters that you can get signed if you would like to take a signed poster home. They're free of charge. And, uh, yeah, we'll do a bit of signing. We will be back February 16th in this exact venue, the same venue, and the event will be a debate between uh, Dinesh D'Souza and Alex O'Connor, formerly known as Cosmic Skeptic on YouTube, and they're going to be battling it out. The topic is, is the Bible true? And that'll be February 16th. That, that's going to be a hot event. So, yeah. <laughs> Lawrence just solved the debate in one second. No need to have it. Thank you all very much.